We are situated on the south side of Chicago um, and in an area that is only two minutes away from um, a, the Hyde Park, University of Chicago, 12 minutes away from downtown, um, but worlds away from any form of equity, equality. Um, yeah. And so in, in our space, we are carving out spaces for humanity that have been otherwise neglected, been neglected um, for quite some time. And I think what, uh, you know, when, when I was first approached to do this 100 day studio, I was thinking about mm, what the hell would we possibly share uh, in what one facet, um, but instead of thinking of like studios, but instead I was thinking about, well, what happens if you frame the entire site as a studio, as a community built studio space? Um, so there's lessons to learn, and I will jump into this presentation now. All right, right. So at the heart of this, um, for me, is like in this day and time and era with everything that's going on, on the ground, in the clouds, literally surveillance wise, um, the, the paradigm that is collapsing and un unfolding in front of our very eyes, and we're looking at what new structures need is a question of value. Not looking at value from a traditional um, monetary market analysis, but actual from ethics, morality, um, and a significant shift in paradigm of what is valuable, especially if we're talking about an essential economy, what is essential? Um, one of the realities of COVID and, and, and racism and, and segregation and classism and gendering and everything else is that we are at a we're at a tipping point um, of reassessing what is, what are our cities designed for, who are they for, and what form of humanity are we looking for for the future? So um, I like to start this exercise with a, a vacant lot. Um, the question of value comes up so often of what is the value of something like this? You have a green space, an empty space. Um, and you'll notice this is a, a, from June of 2019. Um, with the frame of a city and neighborhood, typically this falls into the realm of real estate. Um, real estate also is interesting in the 21st century because you're looking at real estate with respect to space and capacity, digital space, the kind we're in right now, and a new form of public as we're revisiting what, what does public even mean now. Um, so a lot of times when you see an empty lot, people think, oh, green space, we need to figure out sustainability. What does that mean? Uh, so then typically you go into this design mode, uh, unfortunately, where you, with this utopian hypothetical um, pipe dreams of what, what should green mean? But then the question is, what is that? Who is it for? What's the cost? Why are we thinking in this way uh, and then the, the big issue is the issue of realis realistically about food, you know, um, but then if you, you know, look at the growing indoor phenomenon, you really need to think about energy. You need to think about water. Um, you can do soilless forms of growing, but one would argue that just growing lettuce indoors or basil is not food. Um, we've also looked at um, these mega structures that have solar panels and what have you, and they're usually campus size when you think about green spaces or sustainability, but then who is it for? Is it just for an insulated um, audience? Is it just for the island? Of, and what is the knowledge? What is the knowledge gained? What's the knowledge shared? Who is it for? How does that cultivate community? Um, and then un unfortunately, a lot of times the garden is reduced to just a you know, lesser value, even though there's infinite amounts of value in sustenance and nourishing knowledge in, in these spaces. So um, a lot of times people will think about things from various ranges that inform policy. So now there's all this talk of impact investment and what, what knowledge informs the policy then of how to rethink about cities. But in the end, you still have these vacant lots. And in the city of Chicago in particular, um, in a lot of areas around um, Midwest, um, there is a completely uh, disproportionate impact on the south and west sides of Chicago, predominantly black and brown, poor um, populations, people of color, 
that are living in areas that have been municipally disinvested for, for generations. So we're, we're left with tons of these vacant lots. So I wanted to start look at our, our site from the lens of, well, how long has it been vacant? What does that mean? Does it tell you? So we went back through Google's sites and uh, looked at May of 2011 and saw that it's still vacant. Um, in this case, we actually found a fire hydrant that was there. But if you look closer, there's still no stop signs. And it tells you something. How are there no stop signs in the area? What happened? What happened to the site? 2007, you could do around the corner and you get this other view of the site. Um, and what you, you look at is you see uh, abandoned buildings, vacant lot. Uh, so it tells this challenge of, of, a, of, a, of a subliminal messaging. And there's a balance between the subliminal and the, and the superliminal. What is it subliminally telling you about fear, uh, negative values versus explicit um, superliminal statements? Uh, so when you look at the actual the housing stock, um, it's been it's clear that there is not a lot of uh, support for housing in the area and immediate surrounding area. And when you look at a larger lens. You look at the, the history of disinvestment or demolition of public housing, what have you, that have plagued uh, Chicago's narrative of housing uh, that is dominated by the concept of blight. Um, death and decay of, a, of, a, of a urban blight, urban decay, but it actually is ironic that it's from uh, the death and decay of a crop. The term is, in, is from agriculture. And it got translated from agriculture to um, housing and neighborhood development and city planning. So all of this is now embedded in our empty lot. So that's the question of value that you begin with when you start to think about well, what can this space be or become? So using the tools that are typically of the trade, people start to delimit and draw the box and look at it from um, you know, spatial analysis from the top down. And this is what city planners typically do. Um, you start gray out everything else around it, look in the surrounding four blocks and you'll start to see there's city owned parcels. There are absentee parcels, people that own, but from afar that have no direct investment in that neighborhood. Um, and what we looked at critically is, is it has been a cultivation of an ecology of absence. So 79% of our area is vacant, vacant parcels, empty lots. 58% are owned by the city of Chicago at this point. 24% are owned by absentee and only 9% are owned by homeowners in this immediate footprint. Um, zoning becomes really interesting because if you look at from the, the notion of history of value of methods of production and making money or tax bases to support the land or support the schools, uh, there's actually the mixed zoning of manufacturing, residential, and commercial in this same footprint. But there has been an ecology of absence, so there's not much there since, like, for decades. So, but it wasn't always like this. And people forget about history. And they overlook the realities of history. So 1895 and 1926, you look at the density of scale. It was an urban, dense neighborhood. It was a community. But realistically, if you go back to April 1st of 1936, and you look at the underwriting manual, the federal underwriting manual for the Housing Administration, it explicitly says that change in racial composition will result in a reduction of value. Explicit, superliminal. This is the policy that then, well, this informed all the policy. So when housing for quote unquote colors was introduced in 1949 to the neighborhood, that was during an era when there was blockbustering and there was a lot of rumors to say, oh no, they're moving in, there goes the neighborhood, we need to move out. And so there was a predatory approach towards housing and that then further accelerated the process of redlining. So uh, redlining has come up as a, as a, as a hot topic now. Um, when you're trying to deal with reconciliation of the role of planners, architects, um, politicians, banks, uh, et cetera, et cetera, it says it in bold. If a neighborhood has retained its stability, it needs to have the same social and racial class. Change in social racial occupancy generally leads to an instability and a reduction in value. And in this case, it says, oh, it's plagued by 100% Negro occupancy. 
So we're redlining it. Could not get it more explicit than that. So I was fast forward to 2012 and what we have, we're left with a, a hole, a rift that has lost, it's lost people, it has ecological damage, um, it has tra it's trauma. This is an embodied site of trauma. Uh, and then this weird psychosis of what is the value and the dollar value is all over the map. So in the neighborhood, in, in Inglewood, people, the prices you'll see range from 5,000 to 250. It's just weird speculations on what empty parcels could mean based on zoning or based on some other form of thought of what I think is another form of craziness and psychosis. Because why is it, what, what is informing this? It's a mystery to me. Uh, so again, we forget how it became this way. There's a deep history of redlining that is representative, uh, in Chicago, that is representative of not just the Midwest, but across the United States. And in fact, a lot of places all over the world. Um, People forget about that this was, it was wealth that it was extracted from the neighborhood and in the form of housing being a monetary gain, a vehicle for monetary gain. But um, when you look at it from an agricultural lens, when you're displaced from your house and your home and you're repeatedly, done, it has a damage and a trauma to not just the individual, but the collective and to the, 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 the emotional ecosystem. How do you begin to heal? when you're constantly displaced and you're constantly pulled and told that you are of no value. So here we are with the very vacant lot. It's quite depressing. Enter Sweetwater Foundation. Um, so our organization, our tagline is there grows the neighborhood. And we're looking at how are new ways to regenerate within that context. Regenerative neighborhood development. And for us, it is a way to, to create, inspire healthy, intergenerational transformative tra in tra you know, neighborhoods and transform the ecology of formerly blighted spaces. So for us, it, it, there's, a, there's a crazy taxonomy of degeneration versus regeneration. And it's interesting, the more people invest technology or external factors to drop in from the top down, it actually doesn't really regenerate. It creates more of a dependency. It creates more of a, a, an alienation process. Whereas from us, we start from the bottom up and we begin to regenerate from the bottom up. Um, so we operate with what we call the third sector. Most people are think familiar with the public and the private sector, but we, we operate in this kind of, in this fulcrum of across, we're a leverage point between the public and private sectors mixing art, art, architecture, agriculture, aquaponics, um, carpentry, planning, uh, education, it's mixed methods, very transdisciplinary. So in this same area, from where that vacant lot was, just to give a context of history, this was our site. Tw uh, 2013, this is an, an image from Google Street View of what was in the, in the area. It's kind of hollowed out, as mentioned. Within several years, we've transformed the space and place into a gathering place, into a place. Um, the, the house with the mural is the Think Do House. The garden is open to the public. We've started design um, seating for the general public to gather. Now, keep in mind, this is pre-COVID. So our formulation of new publics was to bring people together with good design, good food, um, very intergenerational people from the neighborhood, some people from outside the neighborhood coming together to create the space for humanity. This is an odd picture, right? We have a, a school bus with kids doing a field trip to a, that same house that was foreclosed, but now they're going to school on a field trip. Uh, and their school is right outside. The biology is in, in the garden. Uh, the math class is in the garden. But at the same time, we're looking at mothers, grandmothers, grandfathers, uncles that are in the same context and sharing their knowledge and history of the plants, the food, the great migration going from Mississippi, Arkansas, Alabama, migrating to Chicago, the experience, the, the tactile experience of just touching and harvesting your own broccoli. That is not a city phenomenon. It should be. It has been designed out of our cities. When you have a family field trip that is a school 
field trip, but then it's also an exposure opportunity to the possibility of new design in the same neighborhood that has been left vacant that is transformative across generations. That expresses love, that expresses hope. So for us, the, 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 the various forms of cucumbers, fresh produce, um, in real markets, creating a space, an interpersonal market, not an algorithmic form of a market that humanizes and grounds, uh, you know, holds us accountable, but also feeds and nourishes us. So it was interesting. So we had the space just constantly evolving in front, but the ecology of the place also started to transform. We saw more bees than ever, more butterflies, more grasshoppers, more moths. Um, and so, it started to mean a lot to have this kind of rural phenomenon in an urban context, transforming, becoming, yeah, becoming a place where like a meta city, just constant information sharing, constant translation of different backgrounds, cultures in a place that otherwise was left to rot. Um, so we had cooking classes indoors by young and old, Mama Betty, who is a source of culture and knowledge and wisdom. Um, sharing. Again, this is all a cultivation of a different form of a public pre-COVID. Um, art classes inspired by nature, the way it should be. Uh, printing for shirts, hats, bags, screen printing, um, just creating spaces for people to just come in and plug in. Uh, squash blossoms, high-end cuisines, but it was interesting for us as we started getting access to a lot more uh, wasted wood that was being thrown away. If you want to talk about urban ecology, the amount of wood that is discarded by every city, just thrown away, we're throwing away trees. Uh, it, uh, we created a public workshop, a community wood shop um, as an extension of the garden uh, and as an extension of the, the Think Do House and the school. We started creating lesson plans based on the projects creating seats, creating, you know, stackable modular. This is actually a project that we, when we went to Grisdale in, uh, in, in the UK, Grisdale Arts, we connected with Adam Sutherland and his network. Uh, sorry, we went to Ireland Museum of Modern Art to connect with Grisdale. And we did a show called The Fair Land. And one of the things that we left with is a collective design for this seating, modular seating but it's also, we call it a fractal because it's everything. It's like a bookshelf, it's a stackable thing, it's a table, it's a seat. But we've created um, a product that becomes embedded in our various lesson plans. Again, this is pre-COVID, but claiming space becomes an integral process of our teaching, our methods, our ethos, our logic structure. Um, so again, we have lots of products, transforming, teaching design by reclaiming material that's lost ecologically, otherwise being a landfill, but then creating products that become things. So a lot of what we did, we started to put into public space just to see um, what would happen. We designed it in a barn, because why not? We got a farm. It's the first timber frame barn in the city of Chicago since the fire, we hand raised the hand raised it to become a gathering space. So again, this was a culminating place for our pu various publics. Uh, and I'll keep coming back to that because what do you do when this public is then quarantined? But so outdoor space, street spaces, play spaces, the same area that people think about very negatively, media represents like this, this is never covered in the media. Um, gathering spaces, peaceful convenience very intergenerational, very, very diverse as nature is intended. So our block party will have 750 people for Juneteenth celebration minimum, um, cultural expressions. It's the same place that no one thought anything could exist. There was no plan for development. So a lot of the music, uh, again, and informal expressions in sunflowers. So the regeneration of the space, which is embodied and embedded in this, in, 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 in the concept of rethinking what is place, what is meditation, what is yoga, what is health and wellness, who is it for? Who is, who should it be for? 
Uh, this is actually a puppet show. That's a reclaimed wood turned into a T-Rex as a marionette. And you can see that the kids are kind of lost in this euphoric state uh, of imagination. So yeah, again, we have this really diverse network and in a public forum for to talking about the role of design, how to design for our community, by our community, and transforming our nightlife into a, a kind of a dream space, a liminal space. So just like the sunflower, all of the seeds were embedded. So we started to look at this public space and rethink, what do, what do you do with that lot? Well, it's already in, embedded in our ethos, so instead, what the city plan would miss or what planners would miss or from the top down map, you see just a lot, a series of parcels that used to be houses. But that's our footprint of what we had been transforming for five years. So instead of just mowing the lot, we got to work designing uh, a structure. First we did the platform, then we hand raised uh, a structure with a partnering with a, a woodworking group, Trillium Dell, um, inspired by the worker cottage frame from 1890s um, in the area that's a leftover house that's been for, kind of forgotten. So we built the structure as kind of a pavilion space on an empty lot to activate the space in the style of the barn across the street. But then it became a gathering place and it became a reflection space and it activated the space and become a public park. <laughs> And then we took it away and we put it into the Chicago Architecture Biennial Make and other such stories. Uh, as inspired by the Worker Cottage, which then caused us to rethink, well, what else do we put in its place? We can't just leave the hole in the void. We've activated the space. So we started looking at a modular design, um, reclaimed wood, two by fours, one by material. We charred it with using fire towards the wood. Um, part of our lesson plan, part of our apprenticeship, part of our kind of urban ecology fellows programming. Um, and we started a modular design for hand raising another form of a house. And we call this one the meeting house. This is actually um, uh, a memorial for one of the team members that we've, uh, people in our network that we lost at the time. So while we were building it, we had this loss, but then people said, hey, can we use it as a memorial space? And we said, of course. So we had drumming, um, reading, poetry, singing, outdoor celebration of life. And then we kept going. Um, so reclaiming that space, activating this space by hand raising um, a structure, first is just a pavilion, but then it became actually the meeting house where people say, I want to meet there. I want to have a community meeting, a health meeting, um, a picnic, um, a school session, outdoor. So this was all 2019. And we started to dream about the possibility of what, the, what a marketplace could be. So again, this is a kind of zoom out of a, a, an aerial of our footprint in that same area where there was not much otherwise. And then COVID hit. In the new year, as we're getting gearing up for the new year, trying to think, we're like, what happens when um, and this is pre the mandate for all of the masks. So we said, so, well, okay, well, what's our public then? We should just, we, should, we started to think about we can keep certain practices, but now we have to think about how do you create space and six feet of distance? And then how does that translate to lesson plans and e-learning and what happens to our public that is, is waiting for the spring and the summer to happen? So we started going internal and started to restructure. Um, starting with looking at the wood um, while it's kind of down season, downtime, uh, we started getting back to building, uh, refining our structure, uh, trying to learn about how to restructure the space in order to think about distance and space and refinement. So we, we, we redid the workshop um, out of wasted wood and material. We started thinking about, oh, how do we structure all of this wood that comes in? So we started designing a racking system for eight foot, six foot, four foot, three foot, two foot, that any apprentice could learn how to clean up um, in order to receive wood from anywhere in the city. Because we had different types of pallets and crates 
So once we got our own stock in our stocking process, it created this chaotic balance of chaos and order system, a modular system for us to receive all of the information, all of the wood, which then we started to refine the interior of the workshop, the display cases of our workshops. So our team was starting an internal cohesion that we've never experienced before. Meanwhile, it's still cold. We're preparing indoor and outdoor gardening. Um, and then we get another. <laughs> mandate from the governor saying it's not happening um so all of the schools some spring all everything halted all of the programming all of the summer plans frozen so we can started looking more at both human and physical infrastructure for our needs for our site still in preparation for the possibility of the summer the farm that still needed to happen no matter what so we started designing stop signs where there were no stop signs we started designing um, desks and tables for our future uh, classes. So we started to say, well, what does six feet look like inside the barn if we're going to host an in-person and virtual class for drafting or art or what have you? We started looking at DIY furniture designs that other people can do. So we started going through our sketches and our lesson plans. And we started talking to people from Detroit and New Orleans and looking at pallets and who has access to what pallets and who has access to what tools. So we started sharing a collective network virtually and ideas shared across the network and refining our designs. Um, and in thinking about new forms of infrastructure for water collection on our farm. And then as we started doing the work, moving away from the carpentry back into the farming back into pre preparation of the of the cladding of this of the, of the meeting house we started activating the space as a greenhouse so it became a pickup spot for seedlings it became a, a space of reflection and it's a space for parents to come in to get their students their kids rather because uh, they were not able to go to school to start doing their research and their math. And then all of a sudden we became a family pick up picnic space. Just informally, people would ask, hey, I want to have a space, a safe space, outdoor space, just to have a family gathering. Uh, informal, impromptu performances started to happen. Uh, graduation ceremonies, because no one, we had folks that were graduating from eighth grade or high school, what have you, and they wanted a safe space, not just to physically, like, away from crime and violence, but also a COVID related safe space that they could use. So we started to have these gatherings. Um, there you go. And once the, once people got more wind of what we were doing, we had the seedling pickups, uh, teachers would prepare for their, their spring and or summer classes. More parents were starting to bring their students to the space. And then the public started to show up, the public that we've been connected to for years, we, we've never separated from, we, just, we, we pulled them back in. Then with the mask mandate, we we're like, well, we could do this. Uh, we've learned enough lessons of what to do with a carpentry or, or a gardening space. So uh, through habituation, we've learned what works and what doesn't work. And we've transformed our practice and our praxis. So we've created a six foot space in the alley as an outdoor as it got warmer. So we still do our lesson plans. We still do our products. We evolve new products in the alleyways, um, working in public for people to see that we're still very much active and we're preparing for the market. So this is the, this is the best part. We activated that same space as a garden center and then we activated it as our social distance market. So the products that we were making, the new, the new outdoor patio furniture or the outdoor garden furniture, um, the, the, the screen prints that we were working on, we put on display with the seedlings, with the produce. Um, and the space is now every Friday, we have a social distance market space. Um, and then our new partners, uh, we, we've, uh, we have like 65 pounds of honey that we're getting also now from all of our our worker bees, um, our comrades and allies in ecology here. Uh, so samples of products, uh, produce that people show up. We ended up having a request to use the space as a cooking demo. Um, and what's beautiful is that you can see these lines of sight 
So the reconstruction house, the meeting house, the farm, they're all tied together. Um, so every space is tied together through lines of direct sight, but also um, the, 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 the aerial site analysis is all tied together. The work, the ethos, the practice, all falls in line to what we're calling the Commonwealth. So we're studying what happened with this transformation of the space for a collective wealth sharing across four contiguous city blocks that could potentially reach across 10. Um, so we do have plans for new ground up housing um, that we have done an analysis of looking at who in the surrounding area across the major uh, uh, arteries is is with us so uh, you know who who do we reach and it was walkable two mile radius five mile radius bikeable um, but for us it's all about this this new form of an ethos lot logos ethos pathos this logic ethics and will and for you know, this is a this is an interesting um, diagram of of thinking about consciousness this is an old image that says, you know, at the, at the heart of all of it is, is the earth. And when you actually do the see, touch, taste, hear, smell, associated with your experiential lived reality with the earth, all of the other sensibilities kind of ignite the imagination, um, the intellect, the rationality, all of the spirituality all come together and in tune with the senses. But so for us, we contrast a lot of what people will talk about theoretically, um, you know, from a distance, looking from the top down, not from the ground. Uh, this, the, con the contrast of the picture of life contrasted with the facts of life, the ideal contrast with the real is what makes criticism possible. Without no criticism, there is no progress. And I, I take that quote from uh, Frederick Douglass because uh, of all people, uh, that is one of my top idols. Um, the icon for, for questioning and critiquing um, the systems, the structures. Frederick Douglass was not supposed to be able to do what he did. Frederick Douglass is, is a legend in, in our history um, that, that challenged and made new spaces possible. Um, so that's a glimpse into our uh, lived reality, our community studio space of Sweetwater Foundation, There Grows a Neighborhood. Amazing. Uh, Emmanuel, thank you so much. Um, could, if you want to share the screen, perhaps, um, um, ordinarily, I get, would ask you questions first, but actually one of the questions that's popped up is, I think, quite a uh, primary one. So I'm going to unmute uh, Jay Ranpura if you'd like to ask it. Um, Hi, it's Janaki. I'm here. Um, that was so inspiring and delightful. I'm in Ohio, so I'm not too far away. Um, mm -hmm. My question is related to you know about the decision making team but specifically i've done a lot of work with communities and i find a little bit of a tension between um the very high level of design that you are using and then what a community wants to do in terms of their style of design and i'm wondering about how you make decisions and sort of integrate those things um there, so one fundamental difference, well, let me ask you, how much of the neighborhood are, are actually employed and doing the work in the places that you're referring to? Is it usually top down and people from outside the neighborhood dropping the stuff in or is it coming from bottom up? It's a combination of those things. Sorry, I was yeah. a little bit different than you did. Um, yeah. Yeah, it, it, a, a lot of times there is definitely a tension between who gets the money and who gets to make decisions. I find that is the case with community work. Sure, I mean, but I mean, again, with us, um, the neighborhood's paid, the neighborhood's fed. 
the the public workshop that shows and breaks down how to do the design of the function the furniture first and foremost that creates the space that creates the feedback loop so we have a, we, we've created a space again like i keep going back the space is for humanity what what we look from a regenerative neighborhood development frame um i'm using that language because it's a seventh generation principle it's how do we think about our past, present, and future. So for us, it's a Sankofa thought process. But I mean, this applies to any indigenous, any, 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 any group that cares about their future. Um, so we have these circles where we start the process of saying, hey, what, what should we do next? And we get feedback locally first. We have employees that are from the neighborhood. We have people that are some from out, outside the neighborhood, but their role is to listen to the people in the neighborhood. There's a certain level of respect that comes with that, especially when they see us, when everyone sees us day in and day out for six years, doing the work in welcoming people from out, welcoming people from the neighborhood, prioritizing them first and foremost. There's a certain level of like a trust and bond that formed so that when we, when, when, like, when I, when I throw out, Hey, we're going to design a barn. Does it makes sense? because you have a farm, but then when people see it, they're like, wait, is it a church? Is it, wait, when's it gonna be finished? Because every time I see it, it's changing, it's looking we're like, yeah, come on, check it out. And then we're like, what do we need to add? What type of space would you, you imagine if we put solar on it? What kind of party could we have? You know, what could it be? So we have this really in integrated process of biofeedback. And then when I say biofeedback, it's the humans, that respond, they use the space, it's allowed and allotted for the space to be, you know, so a new structure is not finished. It's never finished. It's constantly changing, usually with the hands as a local hand, but then also like as the ecology gets better, the production gets better, the collard greens get better, the kale, the tomatoes, and then the cultural aspects. People, we, we have a, 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 a unique challenge we can't always get red tomatoes because culturally most people want green tomatoes. And we create the space for that reason. So here's your fried, half the market is gonna be green tomatoes, half the market is gonna be red tomatoes, usually cherry tomatoes. Uh, but so we create this collective process of saying, come in, we're gonna introduce something new. It will be design inspired. It, usually it comes from a mixed bag of like me, our carpenters, um, some elder in the neighborhood that has says, I remember something like that. That looks, feels like something like this. So it's a blend of a past, present, and future. It's unfinished. It's up. And then it's like an acupuncture moment. What stress did we touch? What stress are we resolving? Um, and so for us, the process has been a lot more fluid. The, the second we put stop signs up, people are like, well, yeah, we needed that. It's been two decades. We needed that. Thank you. So it's it's a it's a little bit different for us here. Um, we've got a question from Rosie. Rosie, can you unmute yourself? Sure. Um, hi. Thank you for the presentation. Um, I just wanted to ask. I saw a clip today um, of from the Republican convention, um, and they're kind of using this argument, like this kind of fear of socialism, as a a way of, um, yeah, like a uh, political argument and I wondered if you had faced resistance from the local government um, in Chicago um, about like working collectively and um, working independently as well. That would mean that they would have to be present. <laughs> They're not. Um, we've, we've worked in an area that has had no path of development. And this goes back to that question of value. Since there was no plans for development, then there was no mon monetary incentive for people to pay attention to it. Um, so there was this discussion loosely about doing potentially community gardens as any other. And so it's like, it's, it's, an, it's, it's a forgotten space because the priorities of the government are not this. They have not been this. So we'll we've been literally hidden in plain sight mm. we've been very active it's worked 
it's not challenging anything outright. It is absolutely challenging everything outright, but not in a public way that causes any forms of contention. People know when they step foot on the grounds, it works, it feels good, it's nourishing, and it is designed also to be publicly, publicly, politically a good thing. When you walk into that, when you walk into the neighborhood and you see pockets of 40 to 60% unemployment, you're in an area where all the schools are closed or are facing closure. You're in an area where housing has been torn down. It is not a po good political move for you to say, stop doing this good stuff. Mm -hmm. No matter what, no matter what, 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 <laughs> what uh, Republican, Democrat, whatever, um, we, are, we are seen as being a collective good. Uh, and then we've done enough with the city to host events um, that the Department of Culture Fair and Special Events has wanted us to host public events, and we've done it. We've done, we hosted the Hyde Park Jazz Festival. We've done things that are the right thing to do. Um, it is very, very antithetical to everything else that the city has, has been doing structurally um, because of the paradigm. So it's radical. It's radical as hell. But radical, the definition, what is the definition of radical to you? me yeah. I, mean, I was gonna say that i i think the advice that i'm taking from you is um to just do things without asking well, because well nah, 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 nah. <laughs> careful with that uh you do things understanding the way things have been will be potentially can be but also within a parameter of what you can do um at at the right speed and pace Mm. within a boundary of what is legal, what is not, um, but also questioning why isn't it legal. So there's these gray interstitial third spaces where people say, well, damn, this, this, why wouldn't you do that? Mm. Um, and it fills a void that the general public, the public um, from the political realm should have been doing. And they acknowledge it. Um, it fills a role, role that philanthropy should have been doing, and they acknowledge it. It, role, it fulfills a role that our residents should have been doing, and they acknowledge it. So it's this really this interesting mesh. But what is radical? So I want to I want to leave that. What does it mean? Somebody just posted at the root. Absolutely, because most people most people think of radical being terrorism, extremism scary fear you know especially in this day and time where that 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 convention thing that that portal of covid that you're talking about um that they say that's the the socialism is so crazy and it's most people don't even know the definition of the terms they use mm. just put it that way for us radical means of or restoring to the root so it, it is it is radical um, but not in a fearful way, not in, it's in a very humanizing way that anybody, you can't deny it, which is what you're supposed to do. So that protects us within the political realm. Thank you. Emmanuel, could you say something about um, the relationship you have with uh, architecture students that you have, I think, embedded at the, at the site? Uh, we've had yeah. Andrew Freer previously on the program, obviously working with uh, architecture students on a regular basis. How's that 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 emerged as, as a as a, a an element of Sweetwater Foundation? Um, so in our outreach to a lot of the good allies that we do have, so I'll go back to that last one. Our local government has been recently been fantastic and has created spaces. Says you know what you should do. You should be doing design build. So once we got the green light from our local alderwoman and she's been fully supportive we said great here's another project do you approve is it in the parameters of what we can and shouldn't do then you go to a design build framework that then we we have a mix between high school age students we have high school folks that are no longer in high school then we have colleges that we have strategically reached out to um, i have been faculty at places like university of michigan I've been faculty at various institutions. Um, I was a low fellow at Harvard. 
so we have i have this design background i mean yeah architecture and urban planning and design is what i do um and what's interesting is that in the process of reaching out to those institutions and finding and recruiting people that there's a lot of students that want to be relevant and want to do something different than what they're doing they want to do something that is meaningful not just another studio um, so at University of Michigan, I was a thesis um, advisor and we recruited some of the students that were very, very interested in doing, putting their thesis to work realistically on the ground. So um, one of our fellows is uh, been with us, Sam has been with us for a year now, a full year after his grad, his master's thesis, he's been here. We have a uh, and he's, he's leading the charge with other fellows um, that are just now coming in. He's also working directly with apprentices. He works with our mentors. He's becoming a mentor. He's been here long enough. He's very, very in tune with um, what's happening um, culturally, sociologically. We have other fellows that come in. Um, we've got some from Cornell, um, some from Harvard. But it's interesting because we have to systematically create space for them to unlearn what the pedagogy has taught them to learn. They have to unlearn assumptions, unlearn certain kind of, um, let's face it, there's a design-based approach which is completely, um, uh, uh, it, it's very top-down, it's not sympathetic, it doesn't leave much space, it's, 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 it's a, it, there's a negative, there's a snobbery to it when it's just from an, a top-down, oh, well, design can fix everything. Well, that's, that's not the right attitude to have. So we've created this interface that allows for the design build to happen. We've created a uh, space for people to ground and test their, their thesis, but also to relearn. Um, so we usually say it is a disorientation pe period of at least two to four weeks. Um, and then they reorient. And then uh, over the summer, we had a, a fantastic blend of in-person and remote fellows. And it was interesting, given COVID. Uh, we had some that could be with us and some that were approved prior by the universities to be with us, but they could never get here. So we had the, the designed objects become the thing that orient them. And then we steadily disoriented them by the culture and the ecology and everything else. But the local apprentices had the had to pay extra careful attention to the photographically documenting experiences, interviewing people, sharing those interviews, and translating all of that work out. And it was fascinating because now we have a collection of humans that have never met in person, but they can't wait to meet in person in the future, uh, which is interesting. And is is the is the one of the objectives of of um getting involved in education and in this way that the, the, the format of the Sweetwater Foundation is one that could be um, applied elsewhere? Do you, do you envisage um, that there'll, there'll be kind of graduates from the Sweetwater Foundation who, who could realize as, as comparable projects elsewhere in the city or beyond? Well, they are. Um, so uh, I think I mentioned during the initial quarantine, during the, the kind of yeah, the March, April, May period, we started a process of reaching out to a network of value-based partners. And this is people from Chicago, Milwaukee, Detroit, um, St. Louis, New Orleans, some folks overseas, um, some in South Africa, some in, you know, it's a network of folks because the digital allows us now to, the technology is there for us to share these conversations like this across time zones. Um, and what we have found is that each of us is doing the work, We've known each other for a decade. We have similar conditions. Every, every site is always unique, but there is something that translates every single time about a garden, a, a piece of furniture for the garden, the types of spaces that have been left neglected, the types of designs that work better than others, the types of material accesses, what have you. So actually what we've been doing is training our fellows and apprentices to be ready and equipped to go to those other places. So we have had people that come from out of our, um, you know, a, a semester or 10 week or a year of training with us. And they are, they find a new home in another city, but they're still connected with us. And then they start to translate the work and then they eagerly share what works, what doesn't, you know, how it relates, how it doesn't. 
Um, but it's a it's a very very it's very much on like a mycelial network of 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 people finding each other and just finding solutions. Well, yeah, we tend to call them solutionaries. And so you've been on site for about six years already. In ten years' time, say, what would you imagine? Or what would you hope that you might have realized on the site? Is, I mean, and is there a um, is there a point at which you you, yeah. How how much development can can that site can accommodate? Do you feel uh, can well? Um, our next trajectory is housing, and there's plenty of housing to be made. But while doing housing, we also want to do local community scale manufacturing. So on the site that's on for manufacturing, we're going to do a we're going to build a a building that allows for us to do actual shop work, um, uh, and probably indoor agriculture as well. It kind of goes hand in hand with it. Um, but to, to kind of more directly answer the question, three to five years, we're looking at um, a, a network of leadership shared exchange um, with these value-based partners that we're already connected. There's already, there's already a, a national cry and there needs to be a new system in place because this, is, this, this level of insanity of, of voids is just it's inhumane. Uh, it can no longer continue, period. And people are at the point where they will demand it. It will no longer continue, one way or the other. Um, so we, three to five years, we, you know, our tagline is there grows the neighborhood. That's what this is. Um, I, we have designed a structure where, a, a, an organizational structure where there's a community involvement, there's some external involvement, there's a balance of collective production, um, new forms of capital are being generated in order to support locally. Yes, there's a balance of philanthropy and what have you, but they should continue doing exactly that and do more of it. I mean, you're dealing with generations of neglect, so keep going. Support the organization the way you're supposed to, you need to, so we can build human infrastructure and physical infrastructure needed so that in three years we have housing being co-produced locally that housing is actually affordable and tied to the education, the outreach, uh, the farm, the gardening, the collectivity, new forms of public that we're discovering right now with the technology. Um, God knows what post COVID reality looks like anyway, as a new normal. Um, but it's a collective secession plan. Um, so that we should design ourselves. Out of the picture. Into, into the future, yeah. Um, last question from me. Um, can you just tell us what's, what, what will be happening on the site in the next month or so? I, I mean, I know you have this exhibition planned, but... Uh... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, um, dealing with the reality that more than likely I cannot... Well, uh, I don't want to get into any further dystopian madness, but November is, is around the corner. Uh, no one knows what November will hold. Um, we do know that schools are not in session in the way that they normally are. And it, the, the, the fall typically does uh, create an acceleration of cold cases, flu, et cetera, which will potentially compound our COVID reality. Um, so we are designing um, a show in the barn that partners with a network of, of, of our community-based partners, our institution partners, Smart Museum of Art, Museum of Art, and some other MacArthur Fellows, um, that, that critically look at um, issues of water and soil in these same neighborhoods. This is a red line neighborhood, but this is representative of a much more of, of a larger issue of uh, of a neglect of ecology and humanity. So we're doing a show about water um, in the barn. And it's like the um, a geological analysis, sociological analysis um, of redlined sites such as this one. Uh, what happens with toxicity of lead um, to in the water to schools, school children, families? Um, how does it affect food systems? So we're like this really wide reaching um, um, topic that grounds itself by a, a custom design of a well 
and talking about wells should be public for all. So Inigo is, is one of the MacArthur Fellows. I'll, send, I'll share this out with everybody. But we're designing a space that can be both virtual and in person. So we're looking at things like Matterport. Um, so you can, you can do the kind of aerial footage and come into the space because technology allows you to, to go into the spaces now, do the 360 pan, and then you'll be able to kind of identify and select aspects in the space to get more information, get more information to the artist. So it's an experiment of what does a gallery look like in the barn um, that's both in person, curated intentionally with very small numbers in, in person uh, and then online. We're also doing an installation. Um, we, got, we acquired a church that's in our backyard that is a historic church that everyone from the neighborhood knows, but this is, there's no real records of the church, which is interesting. Um, so we're, we're doing the data mining and cultural pr historical preservation of that. We've been identified for a place saving and keep a saving uh, and keeping grant for uh, African-American cultural heritage. So we're gonna renovate the church and to call it the Civic Arts Church as an extension of the Commonwealth. Um, but Mel Chen is going to be doing an installation on the outside of it, and we're going to activate it around analysis of soil, what does soil mean to the neighborhood, what's the memories of the neighborhood. Um, so we, we're, we're doing e-learning, distance learning, but still doing the art and performative thing in these spaces as we prepare again for the spring and ultimately for summer of next year. Um, I'm really completely awed. <laughs> You've done the busiest man on earth. Um, and I'm enormously grateful uh, for you making some, uh, just an hour's time for us today. Um, Emmanuel, I, I, I really, of, of all the pla new places I've kind of learned about in the course of this program, yours is, is the one I really want to go and see. Um, well, well we, we're preparing to hopefully see you in the near future. <laughs>